Hello, everyone. So um, as part of this practical training in bioinformatics, so, um, for the next three lectures, we're going to be talking about structural bioinformatics, which is a subfield of, of bioinformatics. So today I'm, I'm going to show you a quick introduction to why structural bioinformatics and why is this interesting, why are proteins interesting. So up, at, up until this point in the course, we'll be talking primarily about uh, sequences. And so, uh, of course, inside the cell, uh, what actually does the work of most things that are required are proteins. So proteins are essentially small machines that can do a uh, quite large number of things. So here I'm showing you also putting proteins in the context of the, the sort of bigger picture of the cell and then the organism in terms specifically of size. So uh, pr proteins are essentially sort of really atomic level machines that work at the nanometer scale. And they're quite dynamic, we will get into that. Um, and of course, they're much smaller than the scale of the organism, which is many orders of magnitude above that. So it's quite interesting that you know these tiny molecular machines working together within the cells can give rise to complicated behaviors. And it's very interesting to be able to understand how these machines work and how they interact with each other to give rise to these, these properties of cells and how, how our whole body gets, gets built. So if you were to be able to look inside the cells, of course we, we cannot, but here's a, an artistic representation, uh, but it's quite an accurate representation in some aspects. So for example, many of the machines that we're seeing here, we're seeing this, this micro machine that's taking this vesicle along, uh, let's call it a highway inside the cell. And the motion that it's doing with these things that almost look like feet is, is atomically correct. So one of the few things that's not very correct in this uh, representation uh, is how crowded the cell is. In fact, the cells would be much more crowded. So there'll be much more, many more things inside the cell happening at the same time. But this gives you at least uh, to spark your imagination of how these molecular, tiny molecular machines are operating inside the cells and how they're interacting with each other to generate you know, complicated behaviors. So we, of course, we know quite a lot about protein structures and how sequence translates to protein structures. Uh, and so we, we should probably have heard about this, the, the central properties of how sequences encode for local secondary structural arrangements, such as these uh, alpha helixes or beta sheets. And then these local arrangements organize themselves into a whole folded protein. Uh, and so on the right side of this uh, schematic, I'm showing you an example of the structure for a protein kinase. It has a particular activity. It performs a certain action. And the structure itself is in encoded in sequence. Um, but of course, uh, it's quite hard to understand uh, from the sequence what this structure could be doing. <clears throat> so how does the sequence... Uh, translate to function and, and structure. This is all has to do with the ordering of the amino acids. In particular, what's different between the amino acids, as you know, is, is these different side chains. So the residues, there are residues that are in common to all amino acids, and then there are residues that are specific to each amino acid, which is the side chains. And these side chains then have different properties. For example, some of these are negatively charged residues. Uh, some of these are positively charged residues. Uh, and, and for example, cysteines can form bonds between them. So different cysteines can create a, a bisulfide bridge between different cysteines and so on. Uh, some of these would be quite small, like glycines, uh, while some of these could be quite large, like the tryptophan, which is very, very bulky, occupies a lot of space. So the ordering of amino acid side chains along the sequence then will, in principle, determine this whole structure and the activity of that structure, how that can act to perform certain things. So uh, there are certain, certain amino acid side chains that prefer to be buried inside the protein, some amino acid side chains that would prefer to be on the outside of proteins. Oftentimes we, we see representations of structures as, as, as static because that's how we see them as pictures, but in fact they, can be, they are quite dynamic. So here's an example of a protein that uh, gen generates uh, gradients, NATP. Uh, so this this motion, this rotation of these proteins is important for its function. Without this dynamics, um, this protein would not be able to perform its function. 
So how proteins fold is something that's you know has been uh, discussed and and studied for a very long time. Uh, so it it starts being translated with an unfolded sequence, and then through a process that it's still not completely known to date, it will uh, quite rapidly fold into what's called a native state, which is the state that's most stable or lowest energy. But it is also possible that a protein sequence can occupy different states. So if there's different states of equal stability or close to equal stability. <clears throat> so that's a sort of very quick introduction to protein structures. Uh, and of course, uh, as, a, as a type of data, as a type of data that's very interesting to study computationally. And, and it is becoming increasingly interesting because of the amount of such information. This is true for any biological type of data that's been, uh, over the last few years, more and more is being generated. Uh, and so here's, I'm, I'm just showing you on this graph, the number of structures that are deposited in, in a database called the, the Protein Data Bank, which started in 1970, just holding seven structures. And, and recently, it's gone up to close to 200,000 experimentally determined protein structures, with some examples here on the left. And you see how, how this is growing uh, quite rapidly. So I think this is true for any type of data. So it's true for DNA sequences. It's true for measurements of metabolism, for example. And it's also true for, for protein structures. And it's another point to why bioinformatics is so important is the capacity to analyze data is now becoming a quite a, a large bottleneck. And it's also true again here for, for protein structures. So what is bioinformatics applied to in the field of structures or protein structures? There are many things. So one thing has to do with the fact that the structuring codes for function, so therefore if we can compare structures, we are also uh, capable of comparing functions and predicting function. And this is often easier than to do or more, more accurate than doing it by sequence. Here I'm showing an example of two, two sequences which only share 20% sequence identity, but they are very structurally similar. So if you if you look at them by eye, you can see several elements, structural elements that are, are conserved between the two. And so both of these are kinases. They perform a same sort of reaction and it would be hard to predict this purely from sequence. It would only be possible to predict this by, by protein structure. And it's also true that uh, throughout evolution, uh, protein structures retain its shape longer than they retain their sequence. So the, the divergence, the evolution of sequence happens much faster than the evolution of structure. So therefore, if we are to compare across a different organisms, for example, humans and bacteria, uh, we are more likely to find matching relationships if we're comparing the structures. So another application that still relates to function, but also relates to drug, uh, to the development of drugs and therapies, is the identification of binding pockets. So once we have a structure like the one shown here, there are ways, computational ways, to predict where a pocket would be. That would be a, a small molecule binding pocket, and this is both important if we want to predict, for example, whether this could be an enzyme that binds a small, small molecule, which could be a metabolism, but also if for therapy purposes, if I were to develop a drug that would inhibit, let's say, a, an enzyme of a, of a pathogen, but also if we want to develop a drug that is important for curing human diseases, understanding of these pockets, structural understanding of these pockets is, is also a requirement. It's, so it's an important application of structural bioinformatics. Another example that's very related to the one that I just mentioned that relates to therapy, to understanding of diseases, is that if we have a mutation, so for example, these days it's becoming more often common that, uh, that you would sequence your genome, or at least your exome, the protein coding regions of your proteins, for study of rare disorders, for for children uh, that are diagnosed or, or are requiring a diagnosis for red disorder, it's, e it's becoming almost easier now to do that via, via, via exome sequencing. And once you have a series of mutations that we suspect could be causing that disease, 
by overlaying that information in protein structures, we could compare and say, once I see a mutation, for example, here, I find a mutation that's linked to a disease. And this mutation, based on the structure information, we'd be able to predict that it's, it's disrupting, it's affecting uh, the interaction between these two proteins shown here in this, in this example. So the study of the impact of mutations is something that structural bioinformatics can also help to do. One final application, which is uh, an application that relates to the prediction of the structures themselves. So if you have a lot of protein sequences for which you have matched protein structures, uh, one application of structural bioinformatics would be to try to predict and understand how protein sequences fold into a specific shape, a specific three-dimensional shape. This is a problem that has received a lot of attention recently from from a method called the AlphaFold, which has been developed by DeepMind, which is a company which is uh, essentially a, a partner company to Google. And, and this company and this method, and also more recently other methods that have related to this have shown that it is possible now for in large part to predict the structures of many proteins from its sequence. Uh, although these methods still don't understand, so they can still explain uh, how is it that this happens. Okay, so in the practical part of this uh, today's lecture, uh, we're gonna first look at the protein data bank where all these structural information can be identified. So if you if you want to use protein structures, this is the place where you'd find them. Uh, we'll we'll do an exercise to search through this protein data bank using a sequence as a way of retrieving structures that relate to that sequence. We're gonna be looking at the format uh, of how these structures are stored in a way that the computer can read it. And so to, to, to have a quick look at that, here's an example. Every line here is uh, encoding information about one particular atom. So these are the number of atoms. And here's the number of, these are the residues in the protein sequence. So the, here the first four atoms relate to the residue number nine, which is a glycine, which is shown here with the gly. Um, and uh, the important bit about the information is the three-dimensional coordinates. So X, Y, Z. So this particular atom is represented in this file, this text file, by occupying this position in three-dimensional space. And uh, so we'll, we'll discuss a bit more this format in class. Uh, one important thing if you're working with structures is to have a standalone structure viewer, so something that you can open a structure for and manipulate it yourself. So uh, PyMol is a, a good a good uh, standalone protein viewer that you can use. And then to actually do programming, uh, we're going to use uh, this Bio3D package for R. There are equivalent packages for Python, um, but this for you know, for the exercises that we're going to look into, um, this is the package that we're going to use. There's a lot of tutorials on, on this, and this is also why I like this. So you can if you wanted to explore more, you can go through the website and, and read